Well, um, thank you, uh, Nikolai. That's very kind of you. Um, I've got to be a bit more careful, I think, these days and stick to script. So, partly because as I get older, my memory gets worse. But uh, I just want to uh, really look today at a couple of aspects which are really important. I'm not going to talk about Uranav. Uh, I'm going to only talk about the tanker industry. Um, uh, and I, unashamedly, only really about VLCCs and Suez Maxes. It's the only thing that I know anything about. So I just really wanted to focus on that. I want to do a quick run around just to uh, remind us of... Um, just to remind us of uh, some of the forces in the market and what we might like to think about, and then to focus on two aspects. So um, I've used a quote here, forces shaping shipping, and uh, referred to a quote about uh, uh, Shakespeare's Shylock. We're an industry more sinned against than sinning. And I think that many of you might find that surprising, knowing the conduct of most tanker owners. But the fact is, uh, we are victims rather than aggressors in the world. And I think it's uh, sensible to have a walk around quickly. How is it that so often, with such a simple business, I think nearly everybody in this room, if they were stopped and asked the five or six important things about shipping, would absolutely nail them. Just tell you what they were and explain how they impact. And yet it is time and time again ship owners seem to make the mistakes and get it wrong. So how can it be that everything's so well known and so easily forgotten? And maybe it's to do with uh, the sinning aspects of the lifestyle of the ship owner that they tend to forget these things. But I always use a nice little aid memoir, uh, kind of um, uh, uh, MBA-style uh, economist's view, Porter's Five Forces. So let's have a look at them, because I think the first one is the industry is hyper-competitive. And uh, the most important thing about that hyper-competition is that it's caused by the fact that freight is auction sold like a commodity. We deliver a critical service, but we're priced like we were a commodity. And I know that I've been in lots of trouble, both in this forum and in others, uh, in both London and Oslo in the past, for blaming the brokers. It's not about blaming the brokers, but it is about this. It's a Dutch auction. So uh, the person who brings the cheapest ship wins the commission and gets the deal. So it means there's a constant drag on our business. That's why it's important to remember we meet one of the criteria for a really poor business on Porter's Five Forces, which is that we're highly competitive and we tend to drive pricing down. Customers are stronger than us and fewer. We're in a business-to-business -business market. We have hundreds of ship owners, and we probably really only have in the big tanker market 30 customers. So you can see straight away we're absolutely the victims of an imbalance of strength. Then on the supply side, you think, well, at least you get the opportunity to kick your suppliers. Well, I'm afraid not, because the suppliers for us are either on the shipyards, which are supported by governments, or it's on the buying fuel, which comes again from our customers, or we're victims of the banking system. And where better place could I make that point than here? Uh, again, uh, we compete with other ship owners for the attentions of the banking community, and the banks are so few and we are so many. So it, all in all, it looks like on three of, Pi, of Porter's Five Forces, this isn't looking very good. I want to look at the next two. So barriers to entry and obstacles to exit. And I can, I can see already you, you, you know where I'm going with this. It's not looking any better, is it? So um, what can we say about the market today? What we can say about the market is that demand is fantastically shaped. I don't think anybody is looking at the next two years and saying, please, let's have more demand. We have fantastic demand for cargoes. We have growing ton miles. And um, we have outlook from all the agencies which say that we're going to add demand, both in distance to transport and amount to be transported. So on the demand side, it looks fantastic. We better focus on the supply side. And that's what I want to do today on the barriers to entry and the obstacles to exit. So why don't we take a bath? And that's not my Harvey Weinstein moment, all right? All I want to say to you is this is the way we like to think of it. It's a bathtub. Contracting, of course, is the moment when you commit us to further supply. Order book is the thing that everybody focuses on, which potentially overspills the bath. We have the operational fleet. And then we have the plug at the bottom, which is exit through either scrapping or alternatively moving into offshore. And I don't think. I don't think we're going to see much relief from offshore at the moment, but who knows. I don't want to spend too long in the bath, though. That would be a, a terrible thing. Let's have a look at yard capacity, because yard capacity should 
indicate where we're going on those barriers to entry. What we can see from this graph is that although there are very few yards that build Suez Maxis and VLCCs, we can also see that their capacity is falling. The number of active yards and the number of yards capacity and production capacity within the yard is dropping. So that seems to indicate to us that there should be increasing barriers to entry. So this looks like it's actually on the right track. Ordering times have reduced. Availability of refund guarantees looks constrained. So maybe we're going to get somewhere. I think that we were all quite hopeful because we saw that behavior seemed to be quite logical. We had falling freight rates, and then we had this lovely hole here in 16 when we were talking about an unheard of dearth of new orders. And it looked like logic had returned to the shipping industry, and we were in good shape. There's the hole I was talking about. And the response was, ordering went up like that. How did that happen? Defies logic. Well, we have a view on that, and I hope it's one that's right. And our view is that it looks like this, that essentially, a lot of the people that were making those orders, nearly two thirds of them, were indus existing industrial owners. So why is it that they ordered at a time when they had, why did, why did they place these orders at a time when we had all time low freight rates? And our answer is that they had an aging fleet. And what is it that motivated them? Well, the best analogy I could give you is a bit like a drunk Scotsman who was, um, who was brought up before the court for assaulting somebody while he was drunk. And uh, he was accused. You hit the man. And he said, I didn't hit him. I just got my retaliation in first. <laughs> so this is what we think we're seeing here. Essentially, the ship owners were called in off the sidelines to place their orders early in view of their aging fleet. This means that a bubble in ordering which looks worrying, and which I showed you on the previous slide, may simply be that they were called in off the bench early by these guys. And how did they do it? They used a very old-fashioned technique called reducing the price. So we saw a little dip in prices, sub-80 for ships, that pulled in some of that forward demand. So we got it crushed up into our current order book. Unnaturally, because the freight rates were low at the time. Actually, ship owners were behaving in a logical way, counter-cyclically. The shipyards did something that they can only afford to do on an occasional basis. Drop their prices so low that they can pull in the demand from the sidelines. They can't do it permanently because these are loss-making contracts and there's only one villain here, and it's Korea. And the reason it's Korea is because Korea has an industry which it has to maintain. It has really two industries, and it, one of them we all know is tech, and the other one is shipbuilding, and they have to maintain shipbuilding. They have to keep their production going, and they have to keep their skill base. So they had to step in and do it. What I'm trying to get at is that maybe it's not repeatable. And prices seem to indicate that. But look, the order book is not the issue. The order book has been much bigger. We have a much bigger fleet today, and our order book percentage is, relatively speaking, very manageable. Let's remember that rule of thumb, that if ships had a 20-year life, and they were of uniform year of build, you would have to scrap 5% of the world fleet every year, and you'd have to rebuild 5% of the world fleet every year. So seeing a number like 12.8% is not particularly worrying when the new building order time is somewhere between two and three years. Two years. Let me be frank with you, two years. So it's not that frightening, particularly not when you see the growth expectations that we have for the market. But what is our problem is a little bit the fact that the fleet is quite young. So here's our concentration. It's going to be the key issue that we're going to get all of these ships that are currently in the order book in the next 18 months to two years. So what's the impact going to be? And the impact must be that if we have probably the worst first quarter to a year that we've had in 25 years, that order book looks like it's going to stay low and look bad. 
Is there any light at the end of the tunnel? Are we going to get out of this? Well, I think this is the story. Average age of the fleet is encouraging. And what's the reason for the average age of the fleet increasing? It's that it was abnormally low here. What was the hole that created this very young fleet that meant that even though, just remember, 2010 to 2013, this was a significantly loss-making enterprise. Why was the fleet so young then? And the answer is simply this, that in the previous decade, we changed over from single hull to double hull, and we enjoyed a great bonanza on the back of it. But that regulation changing over the fleet left us with a hangover, and the hangover was a very young fleet. So nothing was to be scrapped when the market was terrible. So this is not like 2013. This is not like 2012. Why? Because we're much better positioned here now. We're coming into 20 years of age for those big fleet bubble that was built in the late 90s. There may be light at the end of the tunnel. But, you know, gifts never come in one or twos to ship owners. They come in threes or fours. So not only do we get too many ships in the world fleet, not only do we have an order book that looks a bit daunting, but we have an oil price in backwardation. And if you just look at this, the Contango backwardation line and the storage. And there's no science to this whatsoever. When oil becomes expensive to hold, people don't hold it. And that means they squeeze the whole logistical chain. Not because of big data, not because they've become super clever, but because oil will be cheaper tomorrow than it is today. So don't wait. Use up your inventory get ships off storage and re-deliver them. And what we can see is that whilst we might normally have expected anything up to 55 to 60 ships in logistical storage, and virtually none of this was driven economically, we're getting it squeezed out now, so we're dropping below, we're dropping below 20 ships that are still in storage and they're still being re-delivered. So we're getting additional supply in. And I can hear most of you saying, oh, more bad news for the tanker industry. But wait a moment and think about this. As ships get older, they get more expensive. It's a simple fact of life. And here we are with a very simple age uh, view. Every five years, you go dry till you're 15 years. But after that, all intermediate surveys have to go dry. That means time out. It means thickness measurements. It means increased cost. And we're hitting a lovely spot here. And I know of at least two ship owners who made the decision to scrap because when they took their ship to the shipyard, it wasn't a $2.5 million bill, as we show here, or a $3 million bill. It was seven or eight. No coating of the underdeck, total steel wastage, complete scaffolding required, and welding of the underdeck. $7 million, no thank you. Back out, move along. Of course, many people will tell you that an old ship can be a good ship. If it's been well-maintained, if it has a good crew, it can be a good ship. This argument is right, but it's lost. This argument will not take water anymore, not because it isn't right, but because it's not accepted. And it's not accepted in our modern checkbox, data list, sire-controlled world, where one of the biggest sins you can have is to be old. I'm sure there's a lot of sympathy for that in the audience. <laughs> so maintenance is not the issue. Once you get too old, you get shoved out of the business. And this is really just showing you what happens. So we're just showing a little snapshot of trying to show where people go when they get old. Scrapped, storing, India, very little in spot, east, Red Sea, or inactive. And you can see that as you get older, less and less and less is available to you. The customer addressable market shrinks. And what's important about this graph is that it goes very nicely with the backwardation story. Oil is in backwardation. Storage opportunities are decreasing. So older ships are being forced out of the yellow and into the spot market where they're not usable. This means that we're really flushing the game. It's going to drive storage. And there's a pipeline for storage as well. So we can see 20 plus, 17 to 19 years, these are all very, very scrappable ships. 
And over here, the Suez Max is a little bit less extreme, but looking in the same direction. You know, the only people who think age doesn't matter are the old. To the young people, it's very important. And to the people who want young ships, it's very important. And there's no arguing with the story. We've got something else pressurizing us now and driving us down this channel faster and harder, and it's regulation. So why don't we have a quick look at these? So ballast water treatment, it's going to be an additional expense that has to be added. I know that the IMO blinked on this, but they blinked partly because of the regulatory system and the certifications that it was based on. What we're going to see anyway is that it's going to be more expensive as you go by. You're going to have to retrofit and you're going to have to put more capital onto the table. Sulfur emissions post-2020, we're going to get uh, a really big bump. I'm going to talk a bit about that later on, but it's a, it looks to us that this could be disruptive in a positive way. And that's valuable for us to think about. It's certainly going to help to drive scrapping. The question, of course, will be, what do you do with an old ship? If you don't want to install a scrubber, and compared to a modern ship, it consumes 30 tons more fuel a day, and the price of fuel is going up. You have a major competitive disadvantage. It must be a driver for additional scrapping. Then last, but by no means least, we're going to get Basel IV in uh, 2022. By that stage, maybe DNB won't be in shipping because it seems that the regulators simply want to squeeze out asset-backed finance in the shipping area from the market. It's becoming increasingly difficult for the banks to be involved in the, in, in the business. If it does that, it's going to constrain capital. If it constrains capital, it creates a barrier to entry. If it creates a barrier to entry, then, of course, the fleet will shrink and our freight rates will go up. What choices do we have? First of all, the one that we're most anxious about, and all of us should be anxious about, is non-compliance. There's a risk that nobody's quite worked out how this is going to be put into force, and we want to make sure that whatever happens, it's uniformly enforced and that everybody plays on the same playing field. You can use low sulfur fuel, that's fine. It's probably going to be more expensive, at least in the short term. You can install a scrubber. Retrofitting is prohibitively expensive, and there's another problem. Only 2% of the world fleet has installed them. So will there be heavy fuel oil, heavy sulfur fuel oil available for you to buy? You'll need an offtake agreement, and you'll probably need a swap to protect you. But both of those, the swap is a contract for differences. That means when the oil's very cheap, you could end up paying out on the contract. And can you get supply? That's going to be a big issue. LNG is not viable in the short term. LNG is a very safe fuel as long as it's used by safe people in safe places. It's not a, a really effective fuel for worldwide shipping and certainly not with the infrastructure we have today. So we've got a problem, but I think it's positive because it's disruptive. And that disruption will be a disruption not only around performance and economics, but also around trade. So it could increase ton miles and trade in oil. Here, regulation, of course, for the banks is another barrier to entry decreasing the amount of capital available and that can be advanced. And the great thing about it is that it will also focus on withdrawal of capital from older ships. So again, we keep squeezing that pipeline. It's going to be good for us. Here's the ultimate decision. So if you're playing 21, do you take another card and pay for it and potentially bust your hand? Or do you throw the hand in and collect whatever you've got in the pot? This is the stick-or-twist dilemma of the ship owner. What are the reasons? Well, it might be family history, sentiment. They've been in the business a long time. Just one more go. One more time for the gipper. Wasn't that the expression? Let's have another go around. We've always been in the business. A lot of people work in it. We're well thought of in the local restaurants. Do you stick with it? Because the returns that the current generation is seeing are much worse than the returns on the outlook that their parents might have seen 20 years ago. Not least because, and I can think now of a family that I know reasonably well, who invested in tankers. Their father invested in tankers, uh, God rest his soul, in uh, 2000. 
And he bought a tank for $67 million, and he got 52 and a half as a loan from the bank. If his sons had tried to replicate that two years ago, it would have been 100 million and 50 million from the bank. The equity return story is completely different. You can hope that the cycle is going to turn soon. Basically, you've got your bet on the table. Just hang on a little bit longer. Invested capital and human is almost more important than financial. You may have bank debts that you don't want to realize. And you're hoping, perhaps, in some cases, that you have too much debt to fail. On the other side, regulatory cycle and costs, low freight rate, cash flows are negative, attractive scrap price, additional regulatory costs coming. And the most important thing that I can point to there that will drive behavior is that you have a choice, the stick or twist choice. Do I go into the shipyard and it's two to five million and I don't know which yet? Or do I take one of the highest scrap prices I've seen for a while, nearly $20 million for a VLCC? And sitting somewhere between on the balancing point today, because I know that what you're really interested in is not this theoretical dilemma of a longer term, but what's going to happen next month? What's going to happen next week? Will Pakistan return, increase scrapping capacity? The monsoon season is coming. Is there enough money in the system in order to scrap the number of ships that we want to see? And this is the rolling ball that will decide whether it's this month, next month, in the Q4, or in Q2. One thing I can be sure of is it's going to happen. But the question is when. Of course, one of the obstacles to exit for us has been the refusal of lenders, creditors, bankers to act on failure of companies. And the use of Chapter 11, which has been one of the most destructive obstacles to exit for shipping. We used to be able to buy ships cheaply from bankrupt companies, but companies don't go bankrupt anymore. That's last year's color. So we have high debts, young ships, new build order book, many rely on bailouts, low interest rates, and it undermines the economic recovery. And this was the story of 2012 to 2014. We don't think it's the same time this time around, because this time around, it won't be focused on the company. It's going to be focused on the ship. So here we can see number of VLCCs and Suez Maxes scrapped per year. You see this is the, the single hull to double hull bubble that we talked about. And some of those were also went to offshore. But that was really what made our great end of our great decade, 07 and 08. Not necessarily demand, although demand was good, but this change out was huge. And here we can see we're going into something that looks vaguely similar. So the only way out of our crisis and into a balanced market that will make us money and good returns and a stable future if we use our cash wisely is simply negative cash flow, attractive scrap prices will drive scrapping, and the regulation will support scrapping the way that it did in 2007-2008. That's the optionality, 18.2 for a V. Look at how we're coming up. So it's getting more and more attractive to do it. Here's our bathtub again. So shipping is always dynamic. It's not not going to happen. It is going to happen. It's absolutely certain that it will happen. But when? And what will the thinking be? If the money comes out through scrapping or sale into offshore or whatever, our question is this, where does the cash go? If the cash goes because it comes around here to the ship owners that have already ordered at the shipyard, we're in an extremely strong position. If it comes out of here and exits tankers, we're in an extremely strong position. And that's what we're looking forward to because we believe the pre-ordering has been done. The ship owners got their retaliation in first. We don't believe we'll see a ballooning up of the order book just yet. So there's the tanker bathtub. Unbalanced, but improving. Yard capacity reducing, contracting, still elevated. Korean yards are the key. 
The order book is actually okay. The delivery schedule is a bit prompt. But fleet maturity is driving a pipeline of vessels towards scrapping. Obstacles to exit, utilization post 17 years is actually reducing the obstacles and in encouraging the flow out of ships. Regulations tightening, this could be our new double hull story. Sources of capital remain scarce. So, scrapping initiated, but it needs to go into a new phase. When the year started, we were hoping that we'd see some scrapping. I think we've seen 10 ships go so far, we hear 10 more rumored. And once the ships are rumored and being talked about, they're not available. So, at the moment, things are happening in the right way. It's not impacting the freight market. It's not impacting the freight market because it's not a reality yet. And when it becomes a reality, people will feel the tightness and the freight will change. But do not be dissuaded or discouraged about the outlook because people talk about the new building order book. No ship in a shipyard ever affected the freight rate. All we have to focus on is the fleet on the water, the ones that actually set the pricing. So, contracting, order book, operational fleet, scrapping, regulation. We're at a tipping point. The question is, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, but anyway, we'll be down to 2020 a certainty, and it's a question of when is that ball going to roll, and when eventually are we going to get back into balance and get the bath, the right depth and the right temperature to enjoy it. So, I've basically been preaching recycling. And I'm an unashamed thief of other people's ideas. So let's recycle even slogans of people that we hate. And trust me, I hate this man. But in the service of shipping, and I hope the entertainment of you, I'm prepared to recycle a slogan of a man that I loathe. Scrap now. Scrap early. Scrap often. And together, let's make shipping great again.